The Stamp Act hurt exactly the wrong people in Boston. Lawyers, printers, and people who hung out in taverns, right? Because when you're dealing with legal documents, dice and playing cards, and newspapers as the, you know, the things that are gonna get taxed under the Stamp Act crisis, you're really hitting the, exactly the kind of people who are gonna be uh, very well motivated to get their message out. Let's think about the, at least three different ways in which the city plays together with the Stamp Act. The Stamp Act. First of all, these are urban occupations that are particularly hit by it. So it's, so it's a particular attack on, on urban ways of life. So the city features in that way. Secondly, the city enables them to connect with each other to form these associations. And that's sort of by creating proximity between people, cities enable uh, forming of these, these social linkages. And third, of course, the, the city also creates the, the usable space that can be taken by workers when they went when they went to the streets and and how did that matter? What did they do when you when you took to the streets in Boston in 1765? What did that mean? Well, wh what it initially means is um, forcing the Stamp Act officers to resign, right, and uh, and gathering a bunch of people and uh, and bringing them to your house. What happens in Boston is that there's a, another demonstration that happens 12 days later uh, that's much more violent, and they actually attack the homes of various customs officers and even the Lieutenant Governor Thomas Hutchinson himself, and they destroy a bunch of papers and. It's it's not necessarily altogether clear why that second uh, incident happens, but uh, it is clear that the elite kind of tries to disavow that second demonstration because they think that that was uh, sort of a step too far. But the point is, is that there are both orderly and then disorderly protests against the Stamp Act. Um, that, uh, and again, the, the density of the cities allow uh, groups to come together and make a kind of real show of force to kind of say, we're not going to tolerate um, uh, uh, this type of legislation. And so this just careens out of control in the in the 1770s, right? So we have to give us the last the last steps to get to 1775 and Lexington. Sure. I mean, actually, things calm down quite a bit uh, between 1770 and about 1773. There are threats that Britain might go to war with France again, and uh, or or with Spain. And so um, actually, there's, there's not a lot of um, overt political action in the early 1770s. Uh, but then the the Tea Act really seems to kind of touch off a new crisis. Um, uh, it, the Tea Act um, enacted no new taxes, right? It just continued the tax on tea that had been initially put in place in 1767. Uh, but what it was going to do was make things easier for the East India Company to sell its tea in North America. And it was going to reduce the taxes that the East India Company paid while keeping in place the taxes that the Americans paid on tea. Uh, and so the Americans see this as a slippery slope uh, as a, a seduction into getting them to pay taxes for which they hadn't consented. Um, and uh, through a series of circumstances, uh, it wasn't what the Bostonians wanted to do, but they, they dumped a bunch of tea into the harbor. And, and how did this Tea Party come about? It's sort of a quintessential urban thing, the, the Boston Tea Party. What's the... Sure. I mean, it's, uh, it's, just a re it's, it's just the most interesting example in, in some ways of how you organize Bostonians. Um, you know, it's quite possible that there were elite figures like Samuel Adams organizing this kind of thing behind the scenes. Uh, but there's also some evidence that uh, working people organized it themselves to some degree. And you had teenagers involved. You had guys who worked with their hands. You had a couple of Harvard-educated guys who we think were on the docks that night. And they were trying to beat a certain deadline after which the tea was going to have to be landed. Um, you know, They had asked for the ships to go back to London. Um, but that was technically illegal under customs laws. And when Governor Hutchinson refuses to look the other way, um, the, the owner of one of those ships comes back to the old South Meeting House and says, I'm sorry, but I can't turn my ship around. The, that tea cargo is going to have to land. Uh, and at that point, a bunch of guys dressed as Native Americans come uh, whooping into the Old South Meeting House. Uh, a bunch of guys go down to Griffin's Wharf, and they unload 46 tons of tea and dump it into the harbor when a ton of tea could buy you Paul Revere's house. So it's an enormous waste of, of good tea, right? The, yeah, and, and people were addicted to tea. Americans loved it, right? Um, and so for them to, to take this step, right, they, um, they really start to kind of say, like, they know we love tea, and they're looking for a way to seduce us into uh, paying taxes, even though we're not represented in Parliament. And so, how, how were they persuaded to see see this as being a common fight? You would have correspondence, uh, sometimes linked to the town meeting, sometimes not, uh, in every little town, basically forming a network with Boston at its hub. And the point was to get everybody on the same page about American rights. Now, some towns interpreted things differently. They said, oh, and we've thought of some other grievances that you might want to be thinking about, et cetera, et cetera. Sure. So there's a, there's a give and take. But Samuel Adams and some of his other co-workers in this endeavor in Boston uh, really kind of put themselves in the center of this messaging. And at the same time, they're also corresponding with their counterparts, sons 
of liberty in other colonies as well. And when the First Continental Congress meets in the fall of 1774, they basically portage this network into the associations, right, that are supposed to enforce non-importation and non-exportation. Right by then, um, things have gotten very serious. And this is after the, the closing of Boston's Harbor by the British. Yeah, yeah and basically in, in direct area, response yeah. to the closing of Boston Harbor. And it's the important to remember, guys. right, and the whole Continental Congress forms because a city has been shut down, right? Because the lifeblood of, a, of, an urban, of an urban area, its trade, has been closed by, by the British. And that gives Charleston, for instance, the opportunity to be like, let's send them some rice. Let's send these hungry people who are all going to be out of work, uh, you know, some, some barrels of rice. And, you know, it, it gives other, um, other cities an opportunity to kind of show their solidarity.